What qualifies as cinema? Yeah, this is quite the casual discussion we're having today. Cinema is a funny word that's taken on quite an elitist connotation in recent years. In the modern vernacular, it's become the go-to word for describing high-class artwork, not just with films, but novels and video games and a host of other media. When a project is cinematic, we mean it's powerful, it's epic, it demands attention and praise. We mean artwork that's demonstrated advanced techniques with multi-layered meanings, something that stands out from the so-called drabble of content that's excreted onto our entertainment on a daily basis. Five Nights at Freddy's is a movie. Into the Spider-Verse is cinema. Which is why I think we were all shocked when a buddy spy movie making fun of its own lead proved to be one of cinema's crowning and everlasting achievements. Yes, I mean that with complete sincerity. No, I'm not taking questions at this time. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent is a 2022 action-dramedy, character-driven spy thriller directed by newbie Tom Gormican that came out of nowhere with a film premise so absurd it can't help but acknowledge its own insanity at every turn. And what at first seems to be a rambunctious romp featuring Nick Cage, the only actor whose reputation allows for this, quickly reveals itself to be a far smarter film than I think any of us were expecting. The film wages a war on two axes, first between cinema as an art form and as a business, and between humility and pride, which I've decided to arrange as so. Nick's journey throughout the film transforms him from an egotistical artist, a snob if you will, into a cynical businessman, and finally back into an appreciator. The start of this is easy to see, Nick as an artist clouded by ego, to the point he's unable to see the practical business decisions he needs to make to preserve himself as a performer or family man. He not only embarrasses himself to land a prominent artistic role, but refuses to accept an easy million dollar gig because he doesn't see any artistic merit in it. Similarly, he embarrasses himself in front of his daughter and refuses to acknowledge what she needs from him instead of the other way around. This constant battle costs him not just prestige and finances, but, as you would imagine, his familial relationship. In a move of epic brilliance, Nick is also forced to deal with Nikki, the personification of his own ego, a caricature many have suspected exists in Cage's real mind, which might be true given that Nikki is credited to the actor Nicholas Kim Coppola, Cage's real name. Once he fails to preserve himself, Nick is forced to make the business decision, accepting the gig and, simultaneously, quitting the art, which he's unable to detangle from his ego. During said business decision, he meets Javi, a massive superfan and someone on the opposite side of the field, a proponent of humble art. While you'd expect Javi's adoration to fan Nick's ego, it instead strains it out, forcing Nick to face the aspects of his art form that made him into an artist in the first place. This confrontation between the so-called high art and true art is beautifully and humorously realized in the top three films argument where Javi advocates for Face Off, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and, of course, Paddington 2. Nick's retaliation to Javi's final pick, his clear demonstration of ego dismissing one of cinema's greatest sleeper hits, is not only delightfully rebutted by experiencing the film itself, but hilariously parodies real online intercourse surrounding the film and its legacy. You wouldn't imagine a sequel to a Talking Bear movie would prove to be one of humanity's crowning artistic achievements, but there it is. And by acknowledging that, this movie accepts not only that the seemingly absurd is just as powerful as the seemingly serious, but declares the necessity and validity of the human state of fun. The movie is both justifying its own existence and honoring one of cinema's greatest products in Nick's simple admission. Padding it too is incredible. With a new passion for the artwork, Nick spends the remaining majority of the film working with Javi to craft a new, distinctly personal artwork. The meta script is both comical and invites scrutiny of the film itself, especially when Nick proposes adding an action subplot to help market the film to a more general audience instead of leaving it character-driven. Oh, I hear you say. So the inclusion of the cartel really is just to give the story an action aspect and doesn't in any way add anything meaningful to the thematic weight of the narrative. To which I answer, of course. 
if, that is, you ignore the possibility that the cartel is a stand-in for Nick's own bad habits and self-destructive tendencies that are constantly trying to turn him against the one man responsible for pulling him out of his self-assured destruction and setting him back on the path of artistic sincerity. Artistic sincerity that's left a path of emotional delight so profound it's become manifest as Javi's shrine. As an embodiment of his parasocial love of the artist, with a smattering of delightful easter eggs, Javi's shrine serves to remind Nick that he's fallen short of his own legacy. The man he is now, no longer the legend he's become in Javi's eyes. Javi isn't a blind fanatic, of course. He acknowledges Nick's flaws in humanity, as shown in the, let's call it 6 out of 10 wax statue, but he chooses to cherish it nonetheless, as shown in his unwillingness to give up said statue. Nick realizes his need to rise, to become the legend Javi sees in him, but his ascension takes a perverted turn as Nick, having to literally face himself for what he's about to do, uses the very shrine Javi created to threaten him. Javi is forced to face reality as his love of art is turned against him by the man he fostered it for. Let's be real though, you can't hurt someone with the love you share, and Nick and Javi overcome themselves. Just in time for the cartel to come in and try to kill them anyway. Nick easily saves himself and Javi from the cartel, but he cannot defend his daughter, who he fails to connect with, from that same threat. The very force that separated them in the therapist's office separates them in Mexico. And the moment when Nick is at his most desperate culminates in a final face-off against Nicky. If he's going to fully embrace humble artistry, that which makes him a better man capable of saving his daughter, Nick must destroy Nicky, the egotistical snob. If you, like me, felt their final face-off was somewhat lackluster, I'd encourage you to see a cut scene of the film where Nick engages his ego in a German surrealistic dreamscape, the purest manifestation of high art, and kills it, shooting himself both in the looking glass and in reality to preserve himself. This is, without a doubt, one of the greatest finales to never make it into theaters, as the man who prides himself on his passion for film is forced to eliminate the toxic mindset that evolved from that passion in the first place, all within the confines of his greatest inspiration. Paddington 2 may have been the film that starts Nick on the journey of revelation, but the cabinet of Dr. Cagliostro is the framework within which his reassessment is possible. The film justifies the existence of the Talking Bear sequel without downplaying the brilliance of the classic surrealist masterpiece. They are both just as equally cinema. In the end, Nick's ego, the force that pushed him to overlook sincerity for glory, proves not to be the preservative he thought it was, but the very poison eating him away. Like modern deli meat. By killing his ego, Nick kills his self-destructive tendencies, the cartel, and like all good artists, frames this journey as his next project, using his emotional development as the foundation for the film that brings him the validation he craved from the start of the movie. Which is to say, the success story is in the art fueling the business, not the other way around, and he shares this success with the man who helped him achieve it giving Javi the chance to finally participate in the art he's spent his whole life adoring. The ultimate product of Nick's humble artistry becomes the stepping stone for him to finally bond with his family. His daughter finally invested in her father and his work before he participates in the art she adores. Which is, of course, the very film that brought him back from the edge of his own toxicity. Nick succeeds at his business by embracing art, and in embracing it, he allows himself to succeed at life. So yeah, the film industry is an overcomplicated, stress-inducing, occasionally destructive business. But every once in a while, it graces us with a sequel to a Talking Bear movie. And that is pretty freaking cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my little video essay here in this corner of the internet. I've been wanting to do a video like this for a while, and watching this film last month was such a joy, I knew I needed to touch on it. Anyway, let me know if you'd like to see more like this in the future. If not, that's too bad, because I'm making more regardless. This video should be out by Thanksgiving, so if you're in the US, I hope your celebration is going well. Let me know what you're thankful for down in the comments. Personally, I'm thankful for all of you and the constant support you've all offered me over this past year. And yes, I know exactly how corny that sounds, and I mean every word of it. 
Until next time, I've been Gyro, y'all have been amazing, and I'll see you all on the bright side. God bless.